Thanks again for joining us for this virtual forum, Recovery for All, Tackling Treatment Disparities in Vulnerable Populations. We have two of the best with us today to help us better understand today's topic. They're dedicated champions of accessible, high quality addiction treatment and are committed to ensuring the standard of care in our industry rivals that of physical health care. First, we have Dr. Corey Waller, Brightview's Chief Medical Officer and Editor in Chief of the ASAM Criteria. Dr. Waller. significant barriers to these vulnerable populations that you've seen, um, you've had brought to your desk and tried to really grapple with some solves for. Yeah, thanks so much for, um, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me uh, um, on this webinar and um, also just really thrilled to be able to have this discussion with you, Corey. Um, as you mentioned, we've known each other for quite some time um, and really worked together on a number of different areas um, and uh, and the fact that you all are kind of really looking at this, um, you know, treatment disparities in vulnerable populations um, uh, really speaks to the commitment that you all have um, in really being able to help improve um, uh, not only save lives, but also improve the lives of people with substance use disorders. You know, I think to your question um, that, uh, I mean, you mentioned some of them. So, um, obviously, you know, at SAMHSA, we have, um, uh, a number of different um, areas that we are looking at uh, to um, better understand and provide resources for people who are facing access issues for the, um, the the treatment of substance of a substance use disorder. So that um, obviously speaks to kind of housing. I mean, we know that um, 
that although the vast number of individuals who are um, unhoused or find themselves experiencing homelessness in this country, they don't necessarily have a behavioral health condition, including a substance use disorder, but certainly um, those uh, conditions um, put people at risk for and can exacerbate their substance use disorder. So um, really trying to address some of the housing um, uh, issues. Transportation, we know that, um, you know, particularly in people who live in rural areas and um, uh, frontier areas that transportation to um, brick and mortar uh, um, uh, treatment facilities is all is often difficult, but that can also go for urban um, environments where uh, even though there may be people who have access to public transportation, sometimes it can take hours. For them to really be able to get to um, uh, a, a place where they um, uh, can access uh, services, um, you know, language um, barriers. So, uh, certainly, um, you know, SAMHSA actually just came out with its lang um, uh, language access plan. Um, that was something that uh, really across federal government is. Um, uh, is being pursued and so making sure that we have resources, whether they be, um, you know, some of our, uh, um, uh, grant programs, whether it's some of our training and technical assistance resources that they are accessible to people in different languages. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the other piece, um, uh, and you mentioned, you know, also the people who, uh, are finding themselves in kind of the throes of addiction um, that, uh, you know, all of those social drivers of health, we're, we're kind of now talking, you know, it used to be that social determinants of health. Um, I have recently heard people kind of talk about that, you know, they're not necessarily determinants um, because they are, uh, um, they're, uh, there's something we can do about them. Um, and they're really social drivers of health. Um, uh, so that those pieces are, I think, are things that uh, that we're looking at. And then the last thing I would say is that, you know, stigma is still a huge issue um, in uh, in this um, space for people with substance use disorders really trying to access services. So um, we can talk more about some of the the resources that we have um, to really try and address some of those. But um, but I think those are some of the top ones for us. Yeah. So thank you for that. And you know. It just highlights the no small feat, right? To, to do a good job in uh, in treating uh, comprehensively this population, and I think as we walk through, I would love for you to walk through some of the things that SAMHSA has done in particular, you know, to help build those resources. And and I think that those resources all have to be taken into another little compartment, which is transportation versus uh, housing, you know, versus uh, telecommunication versus even access to care or, you know, community resources all have to be seen through the lens of kind of cultural competency in a way. And uh, we go to the next slide. I, I think that discussing the how we're going to overcome those barriers has to be done through the lens of cultural competency, um, especially um, for these vulnerable individuals, uh, whether they be um, uh, immigrants or whether they uh, be uh, those that have been isolated from other components of the standard kind of ether of the world in a sense. And I think you and I both know in the work that we've done that there are some people who might as well live in a different planet, um, you know, when they have a severe use disorder because of the, the, the locations and the people around them. And I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts on it's not just getting a ride for somebody. Um, for that, but how cultural competency really rolls into building those those fixes. Yeah. Now, I so appreciate this question. You know, I think so. SAMHSA has been spending um, a tremendous amount of time and effort um, and energy, really looking at how can we make our services um, uh, acceptable um, and uh, you know appropriate for various different um, individuals and various different groups, understanding that culture, um, and you know the people aren't necessarily um, you know a one size fits all kind of that I think historically unfortunately some of the um, the ways that we have approached treatment for SUD that that has um, uh, that has kind of um, 
been the norm, but um, but SAMHSA for a long time has really uh, had a focus on um, making sure that uh, services are uh, provided in a culturally responsive, culturally um, appropriate way. So, for example, um, SAMHSA has an Office of Behavioral Health Equity um, that really helps to uh, to ground and ensure that all of the services that, um, so for example, in my uh, um, center, the Center for you know, Substance Use Treatment, um, that we really also are paying attention to kind of that um, uh, that equity lens and um, and helping to to have all of our services really be um, uh, be grounded in that um, cult culturally competent. Um, uh, approach um, many years ago, SAMHSA developed a treatment improvement protocol, um, uh, actually named uh, entitled "Culturally Competent Care for Substance Use Disorders." Um, that is one of the most downloaded uh, products that SAMHSA has on its website, um, and that uh, is also something that we are really looking to update um, because we've learned a lot in um, in the many years since that was originally uh, um, produced. Um, I think the other piece is we have a number of different centers of excellence that we fund um, that are population specific. So there is um, an African American culture um, center of excellence. There's a, um, a Native American um, center of excellence, uh, um, uh, Asian Pacific and um, uh, Hawaiian Native uh, culture uh, center of excellence. Um, so, a number Hispanic Latino center of excellence. So, really a number of centers of excellence that really are dedicated to helping support um, uh, resources and training technical assistance for providers who are, um, who are looking to get more grounded and, and, uh, and, and better able to, um, to treat a, a number of different um, populations uh, within that cultural context. I think the other piece that we, you know, we are a very data driven um, organization and agency. And so we're always looking at the, the data around who is being affected and who is uh, perhaps being disproportionately affected. And so, you know, we know from some of the overdose data that um, that recently came out that fortunately we're seeing a, a significant reduction across the country um, of overdose mortality, but we also see that that is not uh, um, uniform um, and it's not uh, happening kind of equitably. And so we know that American Indian and Alaska Native populations, for example, have seen increases, unfortunately, in, um, in overdose mortality. And so um, I had the opportunity to recently visit um, a couple of uh, um, uh, places in and treatment programs in Washington State as part of SAMHSA's Tribal Technical Advisory Council meeting that uh, that was held on the Lummi Nation, um, and you know I think one of the things that um, uh, was so remarkable to me was that in those um, they both were opioid treatment programs, um, but they were really comprehensive opioid treatment programs. So yeah. one. Um, uh, on the Swinomish Nation um, it provides medical care, primary care, dental care, um, uh, mental health care, and, um, and cultural practices. Um, uh, they have transportation, they have a whole fleet of, um, of uh, um, vans that will actually go and pick people up and, and really meet people where they are um, to provide those services and engage them in a very culturally, um, uh, Kind of centered way, um, you know. I think SAMHSA also has uh, an Office of Tribal Affairs and Policy that, um, in conjunction with that Office of Behavioral Health Equity, really helps us to um, to ensure that we're understanding um, the the cultures and the um, uh, and the context, the cultural context within which many of our <clears throat> services are being provided. Um, and I have to say that that. You know, having those colleagues within our center has um, has just uh, taught me so much about how the services that we're pro that we're supporting and the services that providers also um, are uh, are providing, kind of through our grant funds, for example, um, they're not mutually exclusive. That there are ways that we really can um, provide services in a cultural context, 
and use some of the cultural practices, really use many of the and incorporate many of the cultural practices to help people heal, to help people, um, uh, you know, who have substance use disorders become well. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, there's, there are now, um, I think folks that are really kind of talking about culture as prevention. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the, um, the, uh, the marrying of, um, uh, you know, the, the various different evidence-based practices and, um, you know, other, uh, um, cultural, uh, practices that, that we help support, um, really together. Um, I think how such incredible impact, um, and, uh, and yeah, just excited, um, about kind of all of the, the work that's happening at SAMHSA in that realm. No, it's, uh, it's great. And, you know, it's interesting, the tribal health work that I've done, what I, what I have found is that that group more than really any that I've identified at scale has figured out how to wrap the treatment around the culture rather than trying to wrap the culture around the treatment. Um, and, uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you walk in the tone, the interaction and the cadence, the treatments that are delivered from the behavioral therapeutic side or the uh, peer support side, or even the, the medical, the medicine that's delivered is done always through the, the yeah. lens of that, that culture. And, and what I found that was different from those, like the Toyobi tribe in, uh, in California that I'd done some work with, they, they did a great job of engaging the community mm -hmm. prior to ever building their system. They didn't build it first and then pound the square peg into the round hole. And so, um, as the question, you know, shows on this next slide, the, I'm wondering how we take identifying a vulnerable population, the culture within which they live, and then how do we utilize this community engagement, you know, from the SAMHSA perspective and your individual perspective, given your time in, in the space, how do you feel it would be the best way for us to engage those communities to be a part of building the care uh, without having to start from scratch, right? We know what evidence-based care looks like. So we're not looking for, you know, the thousand points of light, but really engage them in how to take evidence-based care and modify it um, to really engage that uh, kind of community with those cultures and that vulnerable population. Yeah, this is, um, I think, one of my favorite areas um, because uh, in relatively simple terms, um, I guess it, uh, I kind of see the answer as being, you know, talk to people, right? And really, um, I think for, for many of us who have worked in, uh, you know, specialties, SUD treatment facilities, it's very easy to kind of get stuck in our building, right? It's easy to kind of get stuck in the facility and really focus on um, what's happening in the facility. Um, and kind of lose sight of just the community that surrounds that facility or the community kind of that, um, yeah, you know, that that facility is really um, hoping to serve. Um, and getting out and having a very dedicated kind of outreach plan um, as part of the, uh, the service delivery component, I think is, um, is so incredibly important. Um, and when that becomes uh, you know, a dedicated piece of that, uh, that, uh, that service delivery model, um, then it becomes just as important as kind of the service delivery itself. So, um, you know, I think all of the, um, really, uh, um, places that I've gone where, you know, that has been a piece of, and as we, you mentioned, you know, really, uh, I think many of the tribal nations have done that in an incredibly, um, uh, sophisticated way. Yeah. Um, that that then lends itself to really so much just uh, better design, better um, delivery, really, uh, and better engagement, I think, with uh, the people who use those services. You know, I mentioned stigma um, kind of earlier as one of the reasons why um, and one of the, the structural barriers, I think, kind of that we really need to uh, to be addressing. And kind of that engagement, that community engagement, I think also is an incredibly a significant way of reducing that stigma and 
Um, and because then people understand what it is that you're providing, they understand what it is that you're actually, what the purpose is, what the goals are. Um, and, you know, so the, um, the ability of, um, uh, you know, treatment providers to really kind of think about that and think about kind of, um, and have that component uh, as a dedicated piece, um, I think really just can't be overstated. Um, you know, Sam said we have uh, worked very, very, very hard also on ensuring that um, people who have lived experience kind of are at every table. And, you know, there's that saying that, um, you know, nothing uh, about us without us. Um, and to some extent, I think that's kind of one thing that we're really um, uh, trying to support and advance and promote, uh, you know, across the board. And so SAMHSA has an office of recovery um, that uh, it opened a couple of years ago um, to really, and all the staff that work in the um, in that office are in recovery um, from substance use and mental health conditions themselves. Um, you know, the principal deputy assistant secretary for SAMHSA is a person in long term recovery. Um, and so really being able to have those voices of people uh, with lived and living experience um, in in that planning and kind of from the, the very beginning and, uh, you know, the treatment provision, et cetera, that that, that I think is, is, uh, is another way of really being able to get some of that community engagement um, and, uh, and have those voices and those experiences really help to design um, you know, what the services, uh, and what meaningful services really looks like. Um, we are, you know, 1 of the things I'll, I'll just go back to the, um, that visit I, uh, I did in, in Washington. Um, you know, 1 of the things that with, um, having the kind of community engagement boards, having, um, you know, patient advisory councils, having, um, you know, really people kind of that are from the community as part of um, the design uh, also made a huge difference in um, in both of the, the treatment programs that we were able to visit. Um, and you had mentioned also harm reduction. Um, you know, this is one area where SAMHSA um, several years ago in conjunction with the Office of National Drug Control Policy as well as the CDC um, and other federal partners we held a, a first ever harm reduction summit um, uh, that brought people together from across the continuum. So whether it was prevention, treatment, recovery, um, and harm reduction organizations, and you know I think that that um, uh, that kind of gathering and being able to then from that gathering um, take some of the best practices <clears throat> um, in meeting people where they are in. Um, including people with lived experience uh, at various different levels of, you know, system design, service delivery design, um, that was so uh, um, so impactful that SAMHSA also then used that to help to um, de uh, develop the first federal harm reduction framework um, that really speaks to many of the best practices or principles, kind of a um, uh, an approach. That really does say, um, you know, that that uh, um, even if an organization isn't necessarily going to become a harm reduction organization or kind of a harm reduction um, service uh, program itself, that that approach of being kind, meeting people where they are, um, you know, engaging in kind of shared decision making, uh, you know, really being able to take those um, approaches, uh, that's kind of universal. Um, and uh, and that's why one of the the things that we we had a a second harm reduction a virtual mm -hmm. harm reduction summit uh, recently uh, that is also going to just you know had across training and technical assistance and service delivery and um, you know models of care and practices and services that um, there's going to be a lot more coming out from that virtual summit um, that I think is going to. Uh, Continue to help us advance in this uh, in this space. No, and that's and that's great. And I think that one of the the next topic is my one of my favorite topics, and you would probably guess that from just <laughs> me. Um, but the uh, but taking what in many ways are scientifically softer things, culture is hard to quantify, right? It's 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 complex. Uh, Vulnerability is even hard to quantify because. 
a single label rarely depicts vulnerability. It's multiple things together. And then when we talk about a community, um, you know, as a part of that and taking those with lived experience and having them come in, one of the things that I feel like is the biggest areas where addiction medicine has to improve over time is is through developing a set of um, metrics and outcomes and you know measurement based care approaches that allow us to say I did a and b and it gave me c because I think a lot of people one always want to feel like the work that they've done was valuable um, and there are times in which I know as a physician there are many times I've told myself that the work I've done is valuable, but when I look at the numbers, I'm like, oh, actually, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> um, you know, so I'll give myself some comfort in this. So I, I, I'm wondering, what are the what are the ways that uh, you feel that SAMHSA is thinking about um, data from a thirty thousand foot view, but also maybe down even to the ground um, in a uh, a really meaningful use way for that individual patient? Yeah. No, it's such a great question, and it is really important because I think you're right that, um, you know, if you measure it, you can manage it. Manage it. I think also it kind of, if you measure it, um, it becomes more important, right? You focus on it. Um, and, uh, and this is certainly an area where, you know, really SAMHSA um, prioritizes having a very well-designed data strategy <clears throat> that can enhance our ability to collect and analyze and disseminate you know, high quality data, both quantitative and qual and qualitative, because I do think that, you know, what you mentioned in terms of kind of understanding also then what is happening at the individual, um, uh, you know, level that um, a lot of times we kind of forget the qualitative piece of, of this, which just going back to kind of some of the cultural, um, you know, context that we were talking about that you're right, sometimes kind of measuring quantitatively, like what that looks like, what that means, how that translates, that's really hard. Um, but qualitatively, uh, that may be, um, you know, where some of the uh, the richness lies um, uh, in uh, in what we can then learn and, um, and help have that information kind of inform our programs and policies. And so, um, you know, uh, I will say that one of SAMHSA's strategic plan priority areas and pillars is a commitment to data and evidence. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly SAMHSA, um, you know, as folks may be familiar with the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and um, so mm -hmm. that uh, is a um, national kind of, there's some, you know, limitations to it, but it's essentially a nationwide survey of households um, that yep. gives us a whole host of uh, um, quantitative measures around, you know, who's using substances, what substances are they using, um, by demographic characteristics as well, so we really can understand, um, you know, better where some of those disparities are, who's accessing treatment, what kinds of, um, of substance use disorder treatment and other mental health conditions. Um, uh, you know, they are, uh, they're, um, accessing treatment for, um, so that certainly is 1 <clears throat> data source that we use uh, a lot. Um, and recently there have been reports that have come out from, um, that NISDA that have looked at some of the disparities, um, in services and, uh, and, in, uh, um, you know, in care. Um, we also have something called the NSUMS. It's the National Substance Use and Mental Health Services Survey. Um, so that is a voluntary survey of um, all specialty substance use disorder and mental health uh, facilities across the country that are licensed um, at the state level. Um, and uh, it really collects data on kind of the location, the characteristics, all the service provision um, features, and some of the utilization of substance use um, and mental health treatment facilities. And so that gives us kind of another snapshot of um, what is being offered uh, through and what kinds of services, um, not only treatment services, but recovery support services, um, uh, is being offered by specialty behavioral health facilities across the country. Um, uh, SAMHSA also, um, uh, operates and manages something called the drug abuse warning network or DAWN data. And so that is, a um, 
a public health surveillance system um, of emergency departments uh, that really looks at uh, visits related to substances um, uh, and um, uh, across a whole range of substances, both prescription um, medications as well as um, illicit substances, um, and pulls that information directly from electronic health records um, so that we can get a little bit of a better sense of um, alongside a number of other, you know, CDC surveillance um, systems to get a little bit of a better sense of kind of what is being seen in emergency departments across the country um, in terms of substance use and, and misuse. Um, you know, I think the other big thing is, and folks may have seen that um, for years, SAMHSA, uh, for all in all of our grant services, um, our grant uh, programs, whether it's service or technical assistance and training uh, resources, that um, we are, we collect information related to who um, is being served, what kind of services they're receiving, um, some of the national outcome measures. That GIPRA tool, as it's been known, um, has also caused a lot of heartache <laughs> um, because it was very long, very arduous um, to complete, and uh, and really, um, I think, didn't necessarily lend itself to what we needed it for. Um, uh, you know, SAMHSA is held to the um, to that GIPRA Act. It's um, uh, essentially kind of a a, a federal. Um, law that requires that we collect information um, about uh, the services that are being provided. Um, but over the years, I think SAMHSA has kind of added a whole host of number of questions to that survey that um, that the data that we collect from that is not something that we necessarily kind of need under GIPRA. Um, uh, and, um, and I think the criticism has been that, um, well, what do you, you know, what do you need this data for? What what are you using this data for? Because we're not getting it back, kind of uh, to the people. We're not. SAMHSA wasn't giving it back to the people who were, um, you know, collecting it on its behalf. So, um, we have undertaken. SAMHSA has undertaken a huge revision of that. Um, those tools, uh, those client level tools, and um, that uh, that revision has been out for public comment. The public comment period ended yesterday. Um, and so we are now in the process of, you know, really looking at those comments um, and uh, and making some revisions um, uh, based on those comments. Um, and then we'll be putting forth uh, and rolling out um, kind of a, a new uh, revised Gipper tool that really hopes to streamline the tool, gather the information that we really need. And um, I think to the, the question of, you know, really making sure that we're looking at how can we use this to help measure progress in reducing treatment disparities is very much kind of um, paying attention to the demographics uh, and the demographic characteristics um, that are then uh, that we've you know uh, and that we then kind of identify through analysis of the, of the data um, so that we can then better understand who are our services reaching, who are yeah. the um, you know who's getting missed. Uh, for example, and uh, and how can we then actually use that data to help refine and reform, um, uh, you know, our, our our notice of funding opportunities, our programs, um, you know, our technical assistance and training resources, etc. Oh, that's really uh, interesting. I mean, the I always am in a battle with the the data wars, uh, as we call them, the need to know versus nice to know stuff and uh and the nice to know are things that i would like to have a picture of but the people that are every day seeing patients doing things and the patients themselves are like why are you keep asking me this question all right so trying to find that uh happy median uh, you know of what are the data that'll move us versus what are the data that are interesting and uh and i and i'm glad that you guys are grappling with with that reality and you know one of the things we do have data on is you know, that a patient who initiates treatment in addiction care uh, has many other things that can come with it. Um, and, you know, some of those are infectious diseases. Some of those are physical ailments as a uh, secondary conundrum of the disease itself. Um, and, uh, and so drug use and the ways in which certain drugs are used can really create uh, some medical issues and psychiatric issues and all of those things. And, and I'm wondering, um, 
you know, like, like stated on this next slide, like what are those other services that we should be looking to integrate? I, I always use the term addiction adjacent illnesses or things that are so commonly connected to, uh, to this. And I do find, and I'm, and I'm still probably a little frustrated with the lack of focus on this from our addiction medicine fellowship training programs and um, addiction psychiatry training programs is that not really training in the medical care component of this as much as it, it needs to be. And I'm just curious uh, on the thoughts about, uh, you know, that plus what other of those uh, vulnerable uh, patient services we talked about earlier, like, you know, housing or employment, you know, those other kind of, uh, as you say, not determinants, but uh, associated um, uh, barriers, you know, come with. I'm, just, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, so this is also a really um, uh, exciting area for me. Um, you know, I think uh, as someone who practiced for a long time and was the medical director for an opioid treatment program in Baltimore City, where we really um, tried to integrate, uh, um, we had a behavioral health home. Um, so really kind of, we integrated hepatitis C treatment uh, um, and, you know, kind of primary care light services. I think your, um, you know, your uh, um, kind of description of, you know, just people walk in, they don't walk in with just one condition, gotcha. um, you know, uh, very often, right? So, um, so, and what we know from research is that, you know, when people have uh, all those other social drivers of health and also, um, you know, other co-occurring, uh, whether it's physical health or other mental health conditions, that that has an impact on the ability for people to really engage in the um, treatment for the substance use disorder that that may be kind of the reason uh, why they're there or um, you know the thing that we're kind of really focused on. So I think that whole person care um, that is absolutely something that um, that SAMHSA is also very focused on. In fact, one of the other so I mentioned data and evidence and commitment to data and evidence is one of SAMHSA strategic. Uh, priority areas um, as part of a strategic plan. One other area is the integration of um, behavioral and physical health care. Um, and so what that means for us is also really making sure that we're looking at um, not just uh, how do we integrate behavioral health into primary care, but also how do we really integrate primary um, health care into specialty behavioral health treatment um, and those opportunities that, uh, that exist there. Um, the, the same thing I think can be said really for social services, right? So the housing, employment, really those pieces that for many people that um, yes, they they want their, you know, hepatitis C treatment uh, or they want their hepatitis C treated. They wanna feel better physically, um, you know, whether that's from their substance use disorder or their mental health condition or other physical health conditions. But they also really worry about where am I going to put my head at night? Where am I going to, um, you know, how am I going to like pay the the rent? Uh, how am I going to, um, you know, make sure that I have enough to eat? Um, like those kind of that Maslin's hierarchy of need, um, you know, I think is uh, is also something that um, very often is at the top of mind for for the individuals that we uh, that we serve. So, um, Sam said in. Um, Many of our grant programs, um, we we have some very specific grant programs uh, focused on some of that physical health um, integration. So we actually currently have um, uh, something called the Minority AIDS um, Initiative, which is uh, essentially supporting um, treatment providers to make sure that they're screening for and being able to link people to care for hepatitis C, HIV. Um, you know, other uh, communicable diseases, infectious diseases, as well as screen people for other mental health conditions. In many of those programs, we also um, allow funding to be used for recovery housing, for um, other types of, you know, transportation services, for really being able to, uh, to provide that whole person care. Um, we have a specific pilot program called the Portable Clinical Care um, uh, program that actually is focused on specifically unhoused individuals um, and that provides all of those wraparound services um, 
uh, in a uh, kind of a street medicine type approach. And so yeah. really, again, meeting people where they are really kind of making sure that um, that all of those needs are being taken care of. And, you know, I don't know that um, I would separate out kind of, you know, housing, employment, mental health services, the biggest opportunity for progress. I think they're all incredibly important. And so that's partly why we're really looking at this very holistically from that whole person care perspective. I appreciate that for sure. And and I think that there are so many possibilities that just even trying to identify the areas that you want to lean into um, is complex. Because, and I know hospitals have struggled with this for years, right? You know, how much of that high frequency utilizer population would not be in the emergency department if they had a house or they just had transportation to a primary care or they had mental health services to help with the anxiety that drove them to the emergency department. Um, so I, I think that this is definitely an area that's ripe for us down the road on how we best either add these things in-house and or better partner with the community agencies that that already do these things in a, in a more collaborative data-driven way, because it's, it's, it's a hard one uh, for that. And, and I think that it's, it all still comes full circle back to how in this disease, it creates different barriers. Um, just the disease itself can create your own social barriers to care, right? Um, you know, because it, it does, it can create new medical problems that you didn't have. It can create problems with um, going to jail, losing a job. I mean, diabetes generally doesn't put you in jail or lose your, you know, it takes your job away. And this is a very unique uh, disease in, in that sense. Um, if we go to the next slide, I would like to approach this one as a way of how do we reframe and i think we've already brought this up a number uh, of ways how do we reframe the word determinants mm -hmm. in a sense that I, I i think it's so fatalistic you know to talk about it in that way um as compared to um you know what are these opportunities uh that we have like we know that they cause problems for our our patients and our um uh, and even our employees, and this is the interesting thing, is we have a number of employees that see patients, and they're they're taking on the emotional stress of seeing patients that are many times in crisis, but they themselves have some of these same issues uh, to deal with. And so it's more than just a person with a, with addictions issue. It's it's actually the field that works with them um, many times has to struggle with some of these same things during that. So it's in my mind bigger and i'm curious what your thoughts are for how we flip the frame from it being a determinant that we have to somehow steer clear of or just recognizing these as what are the biggest opportunities we have here uh, to give people a way to pivot yeah no i think that that you know um you're uh kind of describing the social determinants like that determinant um kind of word yeah. as as kind of problematic as something that you know i um as i mentioned i i've heard from others um you know kind of across yeah. the board and that um, because it is fatalistic, right? That like, if you're thinking about like, I'm so like, I'm predestined if I'm, if I don't have a house, right? I'm predestined to have all these, um, these, uh, you know, bad outcomes happen to me. And we know that that's not true, right? So um, now is it a driver of, um, uh, or, you know, a, a factor that we need to be paying attention to? Um, absolutely, because we know the people who, um, you know, are unhappy, House, it is much harder to be able to then, um, you know, pay attention to kind of what may be happening in a group counseling session or, you know, even trying to get to um, a place, uh, you know, to, to seek services. And so I think that the this um, shift in terminology, I think, will also uh, really be able to help um, flip some of that script in terms of, um, you know, how do we then kind of look at this? Um, you know, I think one of the, the things that in terms of how SAMHSA is really address, uh, helping to address uh, and mitigate some of these social drivers, you know, we've talked a little bit about, and I mentioned some of the, um, you know, the, the, the services that we do provide. I think the incarcerated population is one that you um, mentioned that is uh, also of incredible importance for, our, for us at SAMHSA, just also understanding 
what the impact of that um, social driver essentially uh, has not only on mortality for when people uh, are released from um, from incarceration, um, but also then the trauma that um, that can come about kind of as a result of that incarceration and. You know, we know that um, the impact of adverse childhood experiences uh, and the, the association between, um, uh, you know, ACEs and uh, substance use and substance use disorders is incredibly, incredibly high. Um, and that those traumatic experiences, um, you know, really not only not only in early childhood, but then also, you know, as adults, that that can then compound uh, kind of um, people's experiences in, tr in trying to to engage with and access services um, and stay in in care. Um, and we, uh, you know, Sam said we have several efforts that are underway to really help. Um, uh, uh, Reduce kind of the impact of that um, in, in that incarcerated population. So, all the way from um, there's some early diversion programs that uh, um, that SAMHSA funds. Uh, you know, my center funds uh, a number of different uh, drug treatment courts, um, uh, adult treatment court, family treatment court to really try and help reduce some of the, uh, the impact of potential um, adverse childhood experiences, really wanted to keep the family together. You know, I think one of the things that we're really looking at is treatment of adults um, with substance use disorders as prevention for their kids. Um, and so uh, making sure that, um, you know, we can provide kind of those treatment services that, uh, that then are gonna help, um, you know, uh, Stabilize uh, parents and um, and the family. Um, we have a tribal healing to wellness court program. Um, we have an adult reentry um, program that really help tries to help support people as they're coming um, out of incarceration um, and really being able to uh, to look at some of those issues related to um, uh, housing and transportation and um, employment. Uh, um, there is uh, right now. There's a um, a very big effort, also really looking at trying to um, uh, advance trauma informed care, and I think this is one area where for um, substance use disorder treatment providers, really having training in how to um, appropriately and um, safely uh, address trauma um, in individual patients is incredibly important because. Um, that can be um, fraught with some issues. Um, uh, you know, trauma um, therapy is not necessarily something that all of our providers get trained in. You know, and if um, you kind of uh, open a Pandora's box um, and do more harm than good, if uh, if folks aren't really um, prepared to to effectively and appropriately um, and safely be able to address some somebody's trauma, um, but having trauma informed and trauma responsive services and a system. Um, is incredibly important. So acknowledging and understanding, you know, the impact that trauma has had on people with substance use disorders and kind of taking that as like a universal trauma-informed approach almost, I think is something that we're really also um, really trying to bake into many of our um, grant programs as well as um, uh, training and technical assistance resources. No, it's so important because the, uh, you know, I think people, I know when I started in this field, being an emergency medicine doctor training in central Philly, trauma informed was not necessarily uh, what we had learned. <laughs> I learned about trauma, but not right, right, right. <laughs> but in a very different way than trauma informed. And so, uh, you know, it begs the question you'd mentioned that, um, you know, a lot of people don't have these skills, or, and I know that there are other skills that honestly the average person who delivers care doesn't necessarily have. And so one of the things that we're always looking for is who to really collaborate with. Um, and on this next slide, you know, talking about the uh, uh, the collaboration, I, I feel like it's important for us to figure out who we should be focusing on for collaboration. And I think that it rolls a lot into um, what vulnerabilities you have, the community engagement that you've done, the so it, it kind of takes all of those things that we've talked about to this point to figure out who. But I'm wondering, um, you know, are there areas that SAMHSA is really working at for how we cross collaborate a little better in these communities so that we can fill those gaps? Yeah, no, it's such an important question because I think, you know, we've talked a lot about um, all these various different, you know, social drivers of health and. 
uh, you know, integration of services, really that whole person approach. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think kind of at the moment, some of our financing systems and, you know, really the, um, uh, the, the systems of care that we have aren't necessarily, and, and maybe shouldn't be, um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, whole person care in one spot. I mean, that would be great. Um, but I also think that, you know, as you mentioned, there are different resources in different places, uh, you know, um, various different, um, strengths and skills and capacity for, um, for folks, uh, um, you know, in various different locations and the needs of, of communities may be different. And so <clears throat> I think for us, really, um, this, uh, this focus on collaboration is huge and, um, uh, you know, understanding it kind of starts, uh, it could start with kind of a needs assessment, a community needs assessment, um, and that that includes a, a little bit of an environmental scan for, you know, what resources are available in the community, um, you know, in the, um, in the recently revised, uh, um, Part 8, 42 CFR Part 8 opioid treatment program um, uh, rule revisions, we really highlight that um, in, in the preamble to that rule, really highlight that, you know, kind of paying attention to all those different efforts and having, um, you know, uh, um, memoranda of understanding or agreements, you know, with other um, resources in the community, that that is a, a very um, appropriate and uh, um, best practice for making sure that the, the services that people are getting um, meet all of their needs, kind of that whole person needs, but not necessarily a requirement that all of it has to be provided by the OTP itself. Um, and so I think that those two things, kind of that needs assessment, that environmental scan, those are um, things that uh, through many of our training and technical assistance resources. So the opiate response network, for example, that we support, um, that uh, um, that SAMHSA supports, kind of, um, uh, and newly has revised. And and um, and if folks are interested, we can. Um, it, there are a lot of different. Uh, resources that we can also kind of provide um, uh, to you all after um, this webinar, but the Addiction Technology Transfer Center, those are all designed really to help, um, and particularly the Open Response Network in the redesign we did in uh, for fiscal year 24, really is meant to be kind of that implementation partner. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, accessing that in uh, and then helping with some of those uh, collaborative efforts um, and really thinking through kind of that needs assessment environmental scan. That's something that um, that the ORN really can help with. No, I, and I appreciate that and, and collaborating, you know, with other treatment providers and other capabilities. It seems like 1 of the things that is rolled out that I, I think has a lot of promise and I, like everything, it's going to be about the execution is the CCBHC models of care. Where we're really trying to organically create that you know that collaboration or artificially create it so that it feels organic. It's probably yeah, absolutely. a better way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then trying to work the payment models behind that so that we can make sure and and support those pieces. And um, so no, I I feel like that's a a piece. It, some of the reason that I found. The things move slowly in this space, or it feels like it's slow. I mean, I guess when you're neck deep in it all day long, it, everything feels like it needs to get done yesterday. Um, <laughs> but I, I do feel that there's still, um, and we've talked about it throughout the entirety of today, there's still stigma. There's still this stigma, not just for our patients, by the way. It's not just the, the patients. I mean, it's uh, the field. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's stigma, I think, at the uh, that I have identified from executives at payers or regulatory or this and as you guys have worked really hard to um, lighten the regulatory load which is greatly appreciated by those of us in the field um the uh i still think we're living with a lot of the the stigma of this disease and i and you know i'm wondering if you have thoughts on if you could pick one or two fundamental changes that we could uh, make to help this part out, um, what those might be. Yeah, I mean, really quickly, because I know we're getting to time, but I think 
one of the big pieces I think is um, we need to be talking with our other healthcare colleagues. Um, because there is such stigma within the healthcare system itself still. Um, and the more that we talk and the more that we are, um, you know, collaborative uh, with our healthcare colleagues to help them understand this is what we do. This is the specialty. This is how we're specialists. This is how we can help you. Um, I think that really then um, helps to, to uh, reduce some of that stigma as well as really talking about it as this is what we're hoping to um, that you could do. Um, you know, for, for our patients and having the focus on the patient as, uh, as kind of the, the common ground. Um, and, uh, so a lot of it is, I think, uh, you know, for ourselves really doing, um, education, 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 um, uh, at every level. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that the, um, the more that we can really also kind of talk about, uh, the people that. You know, we are helping the people that we're serving and working with um, as people um, and, and avoiding some of that stigmatizing language. I think language change also goes a long way. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, that brings us to kind of our final question here, which is, you know, from your standpoint, because you get eyes on a lot of places and a lot of things, you know, from your viewpoint. I mean, have you identified um, any anything that you would love to see expand or you're interested in seeing done? Um, you know, around not even just in the US, but anywhere else, you know, that you've identified some innovative approaches that that might be worth thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, um, given that kind of the uh, US is really our our background uh, or, you know, our playground or um, our, <laughs> our, uh, our, our, um, our setting, right? So, um, I mean, I will say that there are some um, some pretty amazing things happening across the US. We've talked about some of them. But, um, you know, really that in, for me, it's really about kind of that integration piece and um, low barrier models to care so that we're making sure that we're kind of getting people into services um, and then, you know, helping to, um, I think, some of the culturally uh, contextual kind of culturally relevant um, practices that uh, that I mentioned as well that, you know, really um, uh, being able to um, to. Uh, uh, you know, scale some of those, um, I think it's going to have real promise because it, we need to make um, treatment uh, um, of value to people. And when we provide them with value and uh, help reduce that stigma, you know, help really um, engage individuals, I think that that's where we're really going to see some of the, the reductions and, and disparities. Yeah, no, I appreciate that word value is very important for the patient to feel like the time that they spend the interactions that they have the things that that we feel like sometimes very parenterally make them do um, in this space that they feel that it's valuable. So I, I definitely appreciate the, uh, the term there. Um, so, any last, uh, any last thoughts you'd like to. This yeah, way. no, this has just been such a great conversation and I know we could keep going for hours and hours. Um, uh, you know, my hope is that, um, the folks, uh, got something out of this and for a lot more of what I've been mentioning, if you go to the SAMHSA website, um, uh, you know, SAMHSA.gov, there's a whole host of all the training and, um, notice of funding opportunities, kind of grant of, um, opportunities, um, uh, the office of behavioral health equity, the office of recovery, the office of tribal affairs and policy all have, um, resources there, the evidence-based, um, practice, uh, resource center, um, uh, the SAMHSA store also has all the free, um, uh, educational materials, treatment improvement protocols, et cetera. And so, um, it just really help people utilize the, um, the resources that are available. Great. Well, Ingveld, I greatly appreciate you taking the time away from what is a very complex job, uh, to help us better understand all the work that SAMS is doing that you're doing. And, uh, as always, it's wonderful to see you. Um, I wish we could spend, um, more time chatting, um, about it, but, uh, uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, with that, I will give you the rest of your day to go and continue that good work. Great. Thank you so much. You too. Yeah.